Okay, so let's kind of follow up on that business about New Year's resolution. It's actually New Year's Eve right now when I'm recording. Um, and the earlier audio was, um, I think, yesterday. The actual recording date, but it's going to post later. I'm not sure when. Anyway, to follow up on this whole business about... Wait. On this whole business about... Um, New Year's resolutions, and your motive, your own motive before God. That's really the goal of spiritual life. See, you start out empty. You get filled up with all kinds of false information that you don't know is false. You're sort of like, your soul is just a sponge and it absorbs. And the reason why God made it that way is ideally your parents learned truth and therefore you would start out in the best possible way with your soul sponging in truth from your parents so that by the time you yourself were able to think clearly as a result of having all those deposits then you can make decisions based on truth and you know Satan's big argument would be well you know that's stacking the deck in favor of your position, not necessarily the truth. So Satan wanted us to be free to be able to be filled up with his position. So then he spent a lot of time getting the human race all interested in anti-God stuff so that you, as a new soul born, could be filled up with anti-God stuff instead of God stuff. So now it's up to whether your parents fill you up with God stuff or any God stuff. And then once you have the ability, as it were, to have enough information so you can decide for yourself, now you're going to have to be able to discern between one or the other. And of course we know how that plays. It's the other. It's the anti-God stuff we decide in favor of. So... Now understand that the goal of the spiritual life is to, like, fix, correct, undo all the anti-God stuff that's inside your soul. And instead you get filled up with the God stuff. But that at this point, pretty much, for most people, ends up being a choice you have to make as it were swimming against the tide. Swimming upstream like a salmon. Because you first have to sort of like get old enough to decide, well, this is wrong. And then you have to want what's right, what's really right, instead of just throwing out God with the bathwater of all the false doctrine about him you've been given. And then you have to keep fighting to know the truth. Because the whole world is, you know, Satan's playground. But if you keep swimming upstream, then God keeps depositing, 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 depositing. And then you really do get to a point where you can swim upstream because your will is saying yes to him and his power, not yours. His power has, as it were, a base he created, the truth inside your soul, to operate on. What's really happening is you're becoming more and more independent of what the world thinks. You're becoming more independent of what your family thinks, your friends think, the news says, you know, the culture, everything. You're becoming more independent. You're becoming more dependent on what God thinks. And you're more aware of what God thinks. And the substance and the base of what God thinks is more and more and more a part of how you think. That's the whole spiritual life right there. This is what happened to Christ. This is why he could be sinless. He was born sinless to start with. So for him, the big issue, and it was a lot harder than it is for you or me, was to stay sinless. We sin early on, I mean, first five, ten minutes, first two days of our physical lives. Because, you know, we don't feel good. And God wouldn't cry and annoy everybody. But we do. And we don't know any better. It doesn't matter. A sin is a sin whether you know it's a sin or not. 
okay so you know we're spiritually dead we're not spiritually alive like Adam was God just makes the soul at birth he doesn't impute a human spirit to us because our bodies are you know sin is genetic but the soul is perfect at birth and soon thereafter we commit our first sin so you can still say no to sin I can sin or I can eat dinner even now with or without doctrine okay you can say no to sin but the chances that you will are almost zero but it's not about sin it's about knowing God it's about growing in God it's about your motive for living and when you start out you start out empty you get programmed into anti-God motives and once you start wanting God you start getting you find out what the spiritual life is use 1 John 1 9 get under your right teacher talk to God all the time about what you're learning as much as possible maybe sometimes talk to other believers too that's it and the more you do that day in day out day in day out day in day out the more Bible deposits you get from your teacher the more you play with those Bible deposits before God, the more your thinking therefore changes to become like God's. Okay, but that runs in stages itself. And my pastor tried to classify those stages, and I'm sure other pastors have too, but I've never seen anybody do it as well yet. Maybe you know of somebody. Where he classifies it as spiritual childhood, spiritual um teen you know, spiritual adolescence, spiritual adulthood, spiritual maturity. Okay, and a link will be in the video description about how he classified it. And I tried to chart what he was saying because it took him 12 years to go through the stages and show you where in Bible you can find them. But of course, most notably, you'll find them and most easily you'll find them in 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2, where he talks about those three groups. Okay, spiritual children, spiritual young men are like adolescents, young adults. And then fathers, when he says talks to the fathers, those are the spiritually mature. Okay, that's John's terminology for it. The point is, is that you have to mature in the spiritual life. And maturation means every day your thinking becomes more and more like Christ. That's what he had to do. That's how he could stay sinless. You have a choice to do acts, which is a sin, or not. What is your motive? It's really important here. What is your motive for doing X? Now, X might not tempt you because your temptation areas are different. Okay, but that doesn't, that's not good enough. I am not tempted to drink gasoline. It would be a sin to drink gasoline. You know, you're not supposed to harm yourself or kill yourself. All right, that would be a sin to drink gasoline. But I'm not tempted to do that sin. Unless I was standing with the gun in my hand and the trigger was half pulled already, I would be not be tempted to kill anybody, not even a Muslim, not even Obama. I really don't want to kill him. I feel sorry for him. But you know, somebody I, I really can't stand. Cruz, I guess. Well, I'm not really tempted to kill him either. In other words, if I was already in the middle of a temptation to kill somebody, it wouldn't be enough for me to actually try to do it. I would have to have a gun in my hand with the trigger half pulled already for me. You know, because the, the actual temptation to kill for me only has like a nanosecond strength. After that, it dissipates because I'm really not that interested in killing people. You see, now maybe your temptation is something else. Like maybe your temptation is to eat too much chocolate pie. But maybe the temptation passes if you don't have the pie right in front of you with your fork in your hand and your fork in the pie. See the point? A temptation has a window. Okay. It has a window. It has a motive. It has a strength. It has a weakness. God's out to change all of your motives. Because God doesn't sin because he doesn't enjoy it. He knows what it would be like, and it's like, no, not interesting. Or no, bleh. I, I can't be tempted to drink gasoline because, oh, yuck. I'm not. Just, who would want to do that? Okay. 
and other things, I mean, generally that's the same reaction. Lemon meringue pie, not gonna. You put the finger, you put my f fork in the pie, you put it up to my nose, and there's no way I want to open up my mouth and eat it. You'd have to shove it down my mouth. Okay? You have reactions to a lot of things that are like that. Okay, but that's not... The motive there is that you don't like it. You're not tempted. It is not attractive to you. That's part of God's motive. Sin is not attractive to Him. That's not enough. God is attracted instead to something else. So you're more attracted to some other kind of thing. Okay, that's part of God's motive too. The thing you're attracted to is the same as the thing He's attracted to. Or not attracted, but He calls it good. You can't really say that God's motivated. There's nothing that causes a motive in Him. Okay? In us, we have to argue that things motivate us. Because we're small. He's not. Okay, but one of the biggest things about maturing in Christ, turning into God's own thinking inside your own soul, is to have the same motive that God does. That takes time. That's a maturation process. And that's exactly what the new year might offer you if you discover what your motives are. And then you go to God and say, okay, well, what's your motive? And you practice learning what God's motive is. The very repetition of the practice of God's motive will open up in your mind why God likes a certain thing or doesn't. And then you will begin to like it for its own intrinsic reasons like God does too. But at first it's more because God likes it, you want to try to like it. And that's okay. But sooner or later, you got to get off those training wheels. God wants us to think the way He does. That is happiness. That's why God is happy. Because of the way He thinks. That's the heart of this whole story. It has nothing to do with being right or wrong. Right or wrong is secondary. Right or wrong is a result. This is what the Catholics and the Calvinists and all the other religionists don't understand. They're all about right, wrong, sin, not sin. That's not it. Gasoline doesn't taste good. Gasoline will kill you. Well, then I'm not interested. Sin doesn't taste good. Sin isn't interesting. Religiosity doesn't taste good. Religiosity isn't interesting. Here's something else that tastes better, and here's why. See, the religionists are never going to get this. They're never going to understand what spiritual maturity is. They never will be spiritually mature. They're always back in the playground of, this is right and this is wrong. Yeah, you got to start there because when you know nothing, you got to get building blocks. But you have to progress beyond it. And they never do because they're constantly carnal, mostly due to anti-Semitism. 99.9% .9 of Christianity is anti-Semitic. Maybe it's 90%, but it's no lower than 90%. They don't think of themselves as being anti-Semitic, but their doctrines are. Okay, I can't tell you how many Catholics have told me, well, I'm not anti-Semitic. Yeah, you are. You're Catholic. Catholicism is founded on replacement theology. Replacement theology is founded on anti-Semitism. So if you're a Catholic, you're anti-Semitic. I don't care what you call yourself. Catholicism is based on the idea that the Jews lost the promise. That the Christians all inherit that promise. No, they don't. God didn't make the promise to the Jews. He made the promise to Abraham. The Jews inherit the promise from Abraham. There's no way that promise is going to be abrogated. Christ fulfilled the promise. Roman, what was it? You just threw that at me. What was it? Romans 10.4. Christ himself is a telos of the law. Telos means fulfillment of the contract. So Christ is a Jew. God is going to fulfill the promise to the Jews from Abraham. See, the promise went to Abraham, thence to David, that, well, from, a yeah, from Abraham to Moses, to Abraham, to the Jews. To, after Moses, it went to David, then to the Jews, and then Christ is the son of David that, that the promise is fulfilled through 2 Samuel 7. 
So Christ inherits the promise to the Jews. Christ is a Jew. The Catholics like to forget that. They cover it up every opportunity they get. You can't get more anti-Semitic than to be Catholic, Calvinist, SDA, Mormon, uh, Jehovah Witness. They're all anti-Semitic to the core. I, not, very few denominations, only, not even all of them, some of the dispensationalists, some of them. KJVO, they're all anti-Semitic to the core. They're out to destroy the Bible that the Jews wrote, and Gail Ripley in particular. She's totally anti-Semitic. But if you asked her if she was anti-Semitic, she'd say, no, she's not. Because she's so, an anti-Semite becomes immediately um, incapable of thinking. So they don't even know that what they're saying is anti-Semitic. That's how anti-Semitic they are. When you're anti-Semitic, your brain stops working. Look at the Muslims. Their brains don't work. How can you stick your butt up in the air five times a day? Okay. So that kind of insanity is the polar opposite of what God's motive and thought pattern is. And as you start to learn him more and more every day, you start to learn to appreciate what God, as it were, ordained be truth for its own value, beauty, etc. And that's exactly what he wants. Psalm 138, too. He puts the truth above his own name, reputation, person. He loves it more than he loves himself. That's why we exist. We're a way for him to sacrifice himself for the sake of the truth he himself created and ordained. That's what they're doing. We're a three-way gifting between Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why we exist. We are a constant cost. And God's totally happy with that. This is what he created for himself. Now, how do you come to think like that? Satan's busy arguing to us, and you can see why. Well, that's pathetic. That's like, you know... Masochistic, sadistic. Yeah. But God loves it. Now, do you want to love, do you love God? Well, I'll say that we do. It doesn't mean that it's true. Then you love his word. If you love his word, then you learn his word. Once you learn his word, then you really start to love his word. Not because of him, but because of it. And that's the kicker in this audio that I started in the other one. Do it because of the doctrine. That's what got me picking up the audio, the recorder again today. Do it because of the doctrine. I mean, in my particular situation right now, and this is just personal, but it gives, it's an example. There's nothing I want to live for anymore. I, I really, I just wish I were dead. And on top of that, I got certain physical problems that suddenly have come up, probably because I have this attitude. And I'm getting up in the morning because of the doctrine. Do it for the doctrine. Do it for the doctrine. I, I was half asleep for like the last day and a half because I'm so depressed about this. And I got up because of the doctrine. That was what woke me up. Do it for the doctrine. Get up because of the doctrine. It's God doesn't in my particular point in my spiritual development, he doesn't want me to get up because of him. He wants me to get up because of the doctrine. See, the doctrine is in me. I don't care about me. I see no value to my life whatsoever. So brain up means nothing to me at all, zero. And quite frankly, neither does anybody else on this planet. And you can argue all day about whether that's moral or immoral. Doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It's all too small. It's too short. It's just please, just kill me now. I wish I'd never been born. So what's left is a motive to get up in the morning. Do it for the doctrine. The doctrine is in me. Doctrine is beautiful. He's beautiful. The doctrine is beautiful. Not me. Not you. Sorry. No offense. Not. Ooh, all these things that allegedly I might have done good or bad. You know, a whole lot of people praise me. whoop de do, No offense. But it's not me. If it's good, I didn't do it. If it's good, then God made it good. I didn't do it. So yeah, if it's good, I'll say it's good too. Because it's not me who did it. It's the doctrine. 
or it's the Holy Spirit using the doctrine. Me, I'm just a spoon. Somebody else has to like lift me up, carry me. There's nothing good about me of myself. And I don't even want that to be true. I don't want to be good. What, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, who cares? I'm irrelevant. That's why I wish I was dead. It's like, well, what's, what's the point of being alive? And the answer is, the doctrine is inside my body. It's inside my head. It's my soul is still inside my body. Therefore, the doctrine is inside my body because the doctrine is in my soul. And my soul is still in my body. So, for its sake, get up. For its sake, exercise. For its sake, eat. For its sake, shower. For its sake, pay your bills. For its sake, talk to people. That's the only motive I got left. Now, you can argue whether being in this particular state with only that motive left is a good or bad thing. You can argue whether I'm moral, immoral, or amoral. That's not the point. The point is that it is true that the doctrine, do it for the doctrine, is a valid motive. Do it for the doctrine is God's motive. That's why he's doing it. That's Psalm 138 too. There's your Bible verse to point it, to show that it's a valid motive. The thing that's so interesting about that is that once that becomes your motive, then all your other motives, pro or con, sort out underneath. But that has to be the driver motive. First. Doctrine first. Father first is gives way to doctrine first. And my pastor spent a lot of time saying this when he was teaching what he called the protocol plan of God back in 1985. He would say God first, doctrine first, momentum first. Yeah, but the update on that is God first once God is first in your life, which like Abraham you find out when he takes you to the bottom. It's like, where do you go from here? Well, where did God go from there? God knows he's first. Well, to him, the truth matters more than his own person. So once God is first, well, what's higher than God? To God, the truth. Now, he's the one who created it. <laughs> Psalm 138, too, go look it up yourself. You have to look it up in the Hebrew. The King James does get that verse right. A lot of the other translations get it wrong. You know how I condemn the King James translations a lot of time, but in this particular verse, they get it right. God puts the truth above his own name. That's what he wants you to do, too. This is like the final leg of maturation. Christ became the truth. He didn't become father. He became the truth. That's higher kind of hard it sounds kind of almost blasphemous to say that something's higher than God but in God's own opinion Psalm 138 too, he puts the truth above his own person that's where he wants you to look at it too so then he's he wants you to like see it through his eyes well but that is seeing it through his eyes so once the truth see it, you, you progress in your motives when you're Born again. Oh, Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. Yeah, and you don't even know how to spell Jesus. But you want to, you, 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 you're a child, you're a baby, you want to, you, you, you got a baby's volition. See, the volition itself has to mature. A volition only matures based on information. God's volition is total. God's information is total. He didn't create it that way. He just is that way. He doesn't sustain himself. He didn't make himself. He doesn't cause himself to stay that way. He is. And he likes it that way. But, okay, but you aren't. But as he puts himself in you, that strengthens you, that matures you. When I say himself, I mean his thinking. 
That's Bible doctrine. That's what it's for. It's not just to be saved and go to heaven, because most people are going to be saved and going to heaven thinking, Jesus loved me, this I know. That's all they're going to know about him is some song or emotion. They won't know anything about him. I don't care how, even if they got the Bible memorized. They don't have a clue what it means. Look at Thomas Aquinas. That was one of the stupidest guys ever to exist on this planet. I will be posting videos um, showing how dumb he is in his own writing, in his own words. That guy spent a lot of words alleging to know something about God. He wouldn't know God or the Bible if it bit him. And you can prove that in his own words. So too, everybody else. Nearly everybody else. Anybody who's religious, definitely. Because God wants nothing to do with religion. Now, if doctrine is first, because you love it, in other words, you love chocolate pie, you love peanut butter, you love your favorite TV show, you love your car, you love doctrine. It's, it's, it's something you want to spend time on. It's something you want to be around. It's something you want to play with. It's something you want to use. It's something you want an intimate relationship with. You love your spouse. You love your kids. You love your job. You love your hobbies. You love Bible doctrine. It's that kind of love. It's something you want to touch and hold and cherish and be reminded of all the time. It's not love like, well, I ought to do this because it makes me a good person. You could care less about that. You love it. You think about it. It haunts your thoughts. It occupies your mind when you're driving, when you're walking, when you're getting up and when you're going to sleep. That's what, you know, Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy 30 and Deuteronomy 6. When you get up and when you go to sleep, that's where the, the whole Jewish practice of tefillin comes from. They they strap, they put little leather straps around their head. They call that tefillin, T-F-E-L-L-I-N. Go look it up. They're leather straps, and at the end of them, they've got they've got what are called. There was a little box, and inside the little box is a little mini scroll of some or all of the Torah. And the idea is you wear it on your head to have, is to depict having it in your head all the time. You put it on your arms, wrap the leather strips with the Torah at the end on your arms to remind you that whenever you use your arms to be thinking of Torah. That's why they do that. That's what it means. It's a cute, it's a cute idea. Stupid practice, but a cute idea. Just think about it all the time instead of spending the time with the leather straps. Okay, just think the word all the time. Use 1 John 1 9 say, Dad, what should I be thinking now? Cause me to remember any kind of verse that replies, you know, what should I, what, 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 what should be in my head? So you do that, that's better than tefillin. Because if it's in your head, then it's in your whole body. Okay, but it's in your head when you've been learning and living on Bible. So now get up because of the doctrine. So now go to sleep because of the doctrine. So now write your email because of the doctrine. So now pay your bills because of the doctrine. So now eat the right food or the wrong food or any food because of the doctrine. Or don't eat food because of the doctrine. 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 Of the doctrine. And then you got other motives like you like the food or you don't like the food. You like the email or you don't like the email. And they all sort all your other motives sort beneath. Your first bedrock is, bedrock is you want God. That turns into love because you're studying, learning, and living on Bible. Then that's supposed to, in his, what he wants you to do, that's supposed to progress to loving the doctrine above him. That's a killer. Love the doctrine. Do it for the doctrine. Not for me, but for the doctrine. That's where he wants us to go. So then, and only then, when you're on that, what my pastor would call high ground, then you're looking through God's eyes, and you see it like God does, and you know, oh, this is why you created this to be the truth, versus any other kind of creation you can make. That's what answers Satan in the angelic conflict. Because Satan's busy saying, well, you know, you're being sadistic and masochistic. Yeah, you put all these principles and you created truth this way. And you're forcing us to live this way, too. That's not fair. 
Yeah, and once you get up on that mountain, like God took Moses to, and you look down on the whole of the truth that you now know, because you're now in the final stage of spiritual maturation, Oh, this is why you chose your truth to be this way. Oh, well, see, Satan, look, I, you know, this is why God did this rather than what you're saying. This is why God did that rather than what you're saying. And you don't hate Satan. You feel kind of sorry for him, but you don't hate him. And the funny thing is, is that all the angst and struggle, because you're now at the top, okay? You're now on the topmost mountain that God took you to. He put you there, you're standing there, you're looking down at the plain like Moses is looking down at Mount Nebo. And you see why God did what he did. The integrated whys are now plain to you. It doesn't mean that you don't have problems still, and it doesn't mean you stop sinning. Because the goal of this whole plan is not to get you to stop sinning. It's to get you to see through God's eyes. And therefore, in the trial, which is a secondary purpose, really. And therefore, in the trial, you see why, oh, this is why, God, you did this. And then again, secondary, tertiary, quadrary, or whatever you call that. Satan, you're wrong, no offense. But Satan, see, look, this is why. I'm looking, and I'm down, I'm at Mount Nebo now, like Moses was. God put me here. So I could see the whole panorama of why he's doing what he's doing versus what you're saying. And here's why his answer is better than yours, Satan. There's absolutely no animosity kind of kind of bewildered as to why Satan doesn't understand it. But see, when people don't want to understand something, they won't. But it took years of in and out, up and down, practice like piano, use one gentleman and sit on your pastor and talk to God about it every single day for years before you get up on Mount Nebo. And you know, Moses was on Mount Nebo because he sinned, not because he was a good boy. God took him to Mount Nebo because he was punishing Moses for second Meribah where Moses struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. So Moses was mature. And that's how Moses died was on Mount Nebo. He didn't come back down. So when you're mature, you're going to still sin. But it doesn't matter. That's not what it's about. It's about seeing through God's eyes. And when you do, your testimony, even though you don't mean it to be a testimony, is somebody that, oh, I get it now. Oh, wow, God, I see why you did this. Yeah, it's it's more than God, you're right and Satan's wrong. That's, I don't know, I'm petty. It's like, oh, how beautiful the truth is. And that's the watershed moment. And it happens again and again and again. You know, salvation and maturation isn't a momentary thing. It's a, it's a moment by moment thing. One minute you're mature, the next minute you're back being a child again. Okay? And the idea is to have as many moments as possible in the mature category so that you can enjoy even the bad stuff. You know, Hebrews 12 too. Christ enjoyed being on the cross? How is that possible? That verse isn't there to make us feel guilty. That verse is saying, hi, here's the ultimate triumph. Christ is on the cross and he's enjoying it? What, is he a masochist? No, because he sees what the truth is. That's Isaiah 53, 11. Yire, he will see. He's ba, he will be satisfied. That's what Hebrews 12, 2 is talking back to. It's Isaiah 53, 11. But that do yet stick. By means of his truth knowledge, he makes righteous. Christ was thrilled on the cross. At the same time, there's no greater pain. All fused together. It's to mature in that so you can have maximum hurting and maximum joy. All at the same time, like he did on the cross, so you can know what the cross was like for him. 
secondarily to demonstrate to Satan, well, see, you said that no humans would ever want to go this far. It has nothing to do with sinning or not. It has to do with, do you want God that much? Are you willing to be carried by Him to this high ground? And are you willing to be carried again and again and again and again and again and again? Because for you and for me, you know, because we're humans, we sin, we can only experience those highnesses at moments. And it takes a lifetime to even get to the place where you can experience those highnesses at moments. Because God has to keep on increasing and raising your plane of understanding. And in the final spiritual maturation phase, that's what that's what that is. Okay. So do it for the doctrine. Now, maybe you can't or not I can't say a good word. Maybe that's not attractive to you right now. What is attractive to you? What motive that's consistent with God? is attractive to you. Ask Him for that motive to be strengthened. Ask Him to get you closer to do it for the doctrine. Ask Him to explain what at best I'm hinting at here in this audio. Have Him show you the Bible verses, especially Psalm 138 too. And talk to Him about this. Because the idea is that each Christian is supposed to go on this vertical journey. And all I can do is talk about it. The verification has to come from him. So that could be a create for you a really fantastic 2016. For me, it's the only reason I'm going to live in 2016. For you... It might be the best reason to live. And it really is the best reason to live. See through his eyes. I put that on my refrigerator 20 years ago. It's still there now. I've moved many times since, but I always carry that piece of paper with me. See through his eyes. Talk to him about what that means. Peace out. Okay, so what does it mean, do it for the doctrine? Well, when you're doing something you don't want to do because you think you're supposed to, that's the kicker, um, what do you want to call it, hint. Okay? If you don't want to do something, but you think God wants you to do it, then what you're going to do, because you don't want to do it, is you're going to try to justify not doing it. And there's going to be some doctrine that keeps hitting you in the back of the neck about why you ought to do it. Now, Satan knows this, and he's going to take advantage of it, which he does a lot with Christians, by take, creating two opposing sides, neither of which are God's. But because they're opposing, if you're on one side, the opposing side is going to look like God's because it's opposing. All right? So, like... Uh, you know, you got you got your prosperity gospel people on the one side, and then you've got the religionists on the other side who tell you that, you know, God's always supposed to be painful and sour. Okay, neither one of those are God. Both of those are satanic, you know, contentions. But the prosperity gospel people who feel guilty wanting the prosperity gospel will go look at the sour God people and say, well, that must be holy. And then they'll pick the sour God position. They're just as satanic as the prosperity gospel people. And then the sour God people who really are getting sick of this because it is satanic, look at the prosperity gospel sign and say, oh, well, that's the opposite. That must be holy, which it's not. So then you got people going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on either one of those two sides questions. And neither of them are, are, both of them are in Satan's cosmic system. God's answer is, hi, I want, I decreed all truth be beneficial. And I'm going to make good on it all. I'm also decreeing all truth be what it really is. And honey... There's a whole bunch of truth out there that is bad. Satan is a truth. Satan exists. That's that's true. 
Satan gives you all these ideas and says all these things, blah, 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 blah. It's true that those things are out there. It is not true that they're good. But it is true that they're out there. Okay, so since there's a truth that they exist, God can make good on it. This is his cleverness of design. Okay, so his answer is, look, sometimes it hurts. And sometimes it feels good. I want it all to be beneficial whether it hurts or feel, feels good. Feeling good is not the benefit. Hurting is not the pain or the, the loss. Those are just feelings. The thing is or is not good whether it feels good or not. That's the truth. The feeling... Well, how much truth do you have in you? Because, honey, the more truth you got, the less it feels good. And the less it needs to feel good. In order for you to want it. That's the point. Do it for the doctrine. When you go to work in the morning, it doesn't necessarily feel good to get up, take your shower, eat your breakfast, and get out the door. If you're working outside your house, it doesn't necessarily feel good, but you want to do it because it's the right thing to do, the good thing to do, the necessary thing to do. So it doesn't have to feel good to be justified. You're doing it for whatever your reasons are. I need to work because it's the right thing to do. I need to work because somebody needs me to do that work. I need to work because I need the money. I need to work because blah, 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 whatever your reasons are. The work itself doesn't have to feel good to you to justify your going to work. That's a more mature reason for working. You can also work because you have to in order to pay the bills and uh, 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 I resent working the whole time you're working. You hate it, you hate it, you hate it, you hate it, but you do it because you got to. That's less mature. See the difference? You can do a thing you're supposed to do for mature or immature reasons. God's out to mature you so that you your reasons for doing a thing are mature. If you're doing it for the doctrine because you love the beauty of the doctrine, then it doesn't have to feel good or be good in any other way. Now you've hit the pinnacle. Now, in order to get you to that place, sometimes God takes you all the way down through your own bad decisions or somebody else's, doesn't matter. You go all the way down to the bottom. And you have no other motive except Him. And you have no other motive except you're supposed to. And then as you start coming back up, there are other motives or, oh, I got to work because, oh, I enjoy this work. I enjoy this part of my working. I enjoy talking to my clients. I enjoy seeing how satisfied they are if I do a good job. And there are a lot of enjoyments in working. There are a lot of enjoyments in relationships. There are a lot of things that are not enjoyable, too. But those are all ancillary to a sort of like bedrock motive. That's always there, driving, always there, forming, always there, ordering, always there, as it were, um, presiding. That's what president ends up meaning. Presiding over, controlling, determining, ruling. Yeah, because you're trying to be a ruler. The ruling motive. And then there are other motives that come underneath as like little supportive stones. Oh yeah, I want to do this because the doctrine is so beautiful. I want to do this because the doctrine my God loves. You see? I want to do this because, oh well, gee, it's, it's satisfying to do this. Yeah. But if you only did it because it was satisfying to do it, or it felt good, or it meant well, or there was some other, you know, thing, that motive is not going to carry you all the way. They're like training wheels to get to the real bedrock. 
It's really funny. You almost you, you you go up in order to go down. And once you go down, you hit the bedrock, and then the bedrock sort of like reorders all the rocks that are above it. The rocks that are above it are like other motives. But they're not aligned properly on the bedrock. So it's as if God tunnels down below to put you on the bedrock, and then now we have to reconstruct all those stones above the bedrock so that all the stones above the bedrock are in line with the bedrock and due to the bedrock. Now you're building on a firm foundation, as Christ will put it. You're building on the rock. It, it's, you know, it's a mixed metaphor, but, you know, hopefully God will explain it to you. So that's the idea. Do it for the doctrine it means, okay, well, what is the doctrine? Maybe you don't know. Okay, Dad, I want to do it for the doctrine, but you know what? I'm so upset right now or confused right now. I don't even know what the doctrine is. What is it? Watch him feed it to you. Or you can just be saying, I'm doing it for the doctrine, doing it for the doctrine, doing it for the doctrine. You're really not. You're just telling yourself you are. But you're essentially voting to have that motive. So then God will provide it to you if you keep using 1 John 1 9. And sometimes it's like drilling. Doing it for the doctrine, doing it for the doctrine, doing it for the doctrine, doing it for the doctrine. That's drilling. And then God will insert snippets of doctrine you know. And then it starts to become doing it for the doctrine. It's not positive, you know, the power of positive thinking and positive repetition. It's I want to vote for something that God wants, but I don't like it. Where do I get to like it? I want to vote for it. I want to vote for it. I want to vote for it. But you're really not. You just wish you were. And then he inserts the doctrine for you if you keep using one job one nine and keep doing that. Watch. It's really interesting how it works. I, You know, my words cannot really substitute for the actual experience of doing this. So you're going to have to, like, talk to him about this. And, and have him show you what it means. Practice the drilling, what I just said. See how he does it. Because it's, it's recorded all over the Bible, but until, especially in the Psalms, where you, said, where, where you see, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, any of the refrains that David uses. That's what he's doing with it. He's, he's reminding, reminding, he's claiming a doctrine, he's clinging to that statement like a life raft and repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, which you know, your sociologist would call an affirmation. But it isn't an affirmation. It's claiming the truth of a doctrine. Affirmation of itself doesn't mean anything because you can be affirming a lie and telling yourself the lie is true and get strength from that. We're talking about real strength here, not pseudo-strength. David is constantly repeating, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. He's saying that to remind himself of what the truth is. And you can compose your own, you know, as it were, snippets that remind you of the relevant doctrines so that you can grab onto the next rung, so to speak, to motivate you. What should those be? I don't know. we got a whole Bible full of verses. And to each one of us, certain verses, you know, stand better than others. The one he just hit me with while I was talking, Psalm 4610, Stand still, uh, be, be still, and know that I am God. I think it's 4610. Be still and know that I am God is the King James Version translation. Now, Nehemiah 810 is another one. Joy of the Lord is your strength. Ezra 615, why? He just threw Ezra 615 in. That's about Hanukkah. The temple being completed. Okay, I see the relevance now. Because that was a temple's completion date. That's interesting. I have to think about that one. Anyway, you get the idea. So, the idea is, do it for the doctrine. Well, what is the doctrine? And it's a way to find out what it is, not just the doctrine you already know. 
but also to develop and mature in the doctrine you already know. Because what this does is this puts the doctrine itself as your number one reason. And once it becomes your number one reason, okay, I will. Uh, he's interrupting me again about something else. Once it is your number one reason, everything else will sort underneath it. And what he reminded me of was something that caused me to write years ago. Uh, Lord v. Satan 2. I'll put a, v a link to it in the video description. About how these building blocks worked in Christ. Because I forgot about writing about it. It was like 10 years ago. But that is relevant to what I'm saying here. I've got to sign off now because i got to think about that temple analogy. Uh, signing off.